and it struck me, maybe I'm the idiot. So I never thought after my, uh, you know, at that point that I would ever be a person of the level of success that maybe I, I have now. That's what this, this show is all about, um, is trying to talk to folks like yourself who have been so successful about how it all started and what we can maybe glean from your journey. So where, where would you say your beginnings started, for the lack of a better phrase? Like, where do you think it all started for you, Damon? Well, it all started growing up. I mean, I was born in Brooklyn, but at age one, I moved to Hollis, Queens, and it all really started, you know, uh, there, there's a couple of different stages of it. One, by understanding that your day job would never make you rich and that hard work was the only thing in education, in any form of gra grabbing, an ed grabbing an education was going to be the things that are going to help you be successful. And that came from my uh, father who was uh, uh, came over here from Trinidad at 16 years old and swept up the streets until he made enough money to bring his si siblings up over. And my mother, who was a uh, one of three, but had all the hand-me-downs from the two boys in the in the house. And my uh, and you know my great grandmother was a slave. And um, you know that is one part of my beginning, um, being loved by by her. And my parents would get divorced, and at 10 years old, I'd never see or speak to my father ever again. And realizing that my mother was the man of the house, and my mother worked very hard to to give me the things that uh, you know that she could afford to give me an education. So that's one aspect of my life. The next thing that made me was growing up in the community of uh, of, of any community, but this new emerging technology of hip hop. I call it technology. This new emerging way of communication called hip hop. When I was about ten or twelve years old, it came out of the Bronx and made its way into Queens was this this way that like Instagram or Snapchat, we were starting to understand that the plight that we had or the loves and the passion we had in our community was the same in the streets of Compton, was the same in the streets of Florida, but we didn't see that on the six o'clock news, but we heard that through hip hop. That's why I called it a new form of technology or a new delivery of information. When did you first realize that hip hop could be uh, a pathway for business success? Damon, when was when did that start for you? Well, from an unrealistic standpoint, I understood that at about fifteen or sixteen when I first was going on the music tours as a as a roadie on the music tour, not getting paid, but just kind of like running around and like many places in the country or the world, a new cheap drug started to hit the streets called crack cocaine. And unfortunately, as you and I spoke about Hollis, Queens being the home of a lot of legendary people. There were actually legendary drug dealers that President Reagan um, would talk about in Hollis, Queens, and they really uh, took advantage of a lot of the community. But many of the young men and women in the community never saw a person of color on TV who was successful that didn't come from sports and had what we feel was a great ability and a great discipline. Um, so, you know, if I looked uh, to TV to see somebody that looked like me who was an entrepreneur, I didn't really look like Fred G. Sanford, the junk man, was doing that well. Uh, and so if you never saw that, you know, many of us moved over to that side of the world, or of that world, and would be dead or in jail by 21. I happened to go on those music tours, the first rap music tour, uh, which I don't want to date myself. Go for uh, it. I had fat, fat Boys on it, LL Cool J, Houdini, and um, a Big Daddy Kane. And I went on that tour, and I, I realized where, and not the whole tour. Uh, let me let me explain. They would have a spotted date, maybe in Philadelphia, maybe Troy, New York, or someplace like that. And I would go to one of those dates, and I would see somebody like a LL Cool J standing on stage with 20,000 people screaming over him, waving their hands. And this man was making money. And I said, you can actually make money, do something you love, doing something you love. Yeah. You don't have to risk everything. Um, and that was my first point where I said, I know that I can make money there. So I tried to be a rapper. I tried to be a break dancer. And uh, obviously, it didn't work out. Uh, <laughs> well, it's funny. It's funny you say that, Damon, because, you know, when I real I, I when I first realized I couldn't hit the curveball, I couldn't make a jump shot. I couldn't do all that. I knew I'd have to talk about it for a living to get to where I wanted to go. So I guess you you had the same revelation in your area of uh, of your world. 
Huh. I did. I did. And I stumbled so many times and I started so many little businesses that I started out of the need to want to make money and think I was going to be a good jillionaire in one year after this business and they never worked out. I fell mm -hmm. on my face. I was also the guy who was too cool in school that after I uh, finished high school, I took the one year off of college really to party and club and I never went back to college and I laughed at all those kids in school who were applying for colleges and I turned around and I was 22 years old. I was working in Red Lobster and the kids who I laughed at were coming back and I was serving them shrimp in Red Lobster with tartar sauce on my apron and it struck me, maybe I'm the idiot. Um, so I never thought at, after my, uh, you know, at that point that I would ever be a person of the level of success that maybe I, I have now. I thought that, first of all, I was never going to do anything illegal and obviously I can't rap. So... I'm going to start just working every day, nine to five, or whatever it is. Maybe I'll get a city job. Maybe I'll do something of that nature. But that was where I found FUBU because uh, I was working the day job. And I was happy with it, I'll be very honest. I'm always happy with the decisions I make. But I found a hobby called FUBU because I just love to dress people. And I wouldn't realize that I would be here with you today. So before we get a little deeper into that, that was, I guess, your epiphany moment was at a red, a red Lobster where you're just looking down and you're just taking stock and it sort of hits you that there's a different path you need to take in order to you for you to achieve what you knew at the moment like this. You just felt it in your bones like this was a moment that you just needed to pivot right then and there. That was your moment. Yeah, you know, I kind of did the whole thing of, you know, thinking about, you know, if you keep doing the same thing, getting the same results, you know, uh, you know, what is it? Are you that's called insanity. And I had to have a very humbling moment with myself that, um, you know, I, I still till today keep having those moments. But I took inventory and I said, if I keep going down this path, I'll never grasp any level of success that I'm aiming after. Um, and I started to settle a little bit with maybe the rest of my life. I will, you know, just be a waiter and it's fine. You know, that could be fine too. And then I started yeah. to, you know, my, my, my part of aspiration a little bit was if I, if I do a great job as a waiter, maybe I can get into a program of hotel restaurant management, but that was as high as I was aiming at that point. So now let's get to the FUBU part, obviously, because this is where things begin to take a major tick up for you. And so why FUBU? Where, where did this come from? And and what, where where did it all, I guess, start with a big break for you? If you can walk me through that, Damon. Well, my career has been a million big breaks. Uh, FUBU started when um, I was really looking for some clothing to wear and um, in which I'd already supported so many of the designers that are out in the market at the time. And then I, we just started to hear this kind of this, they started to get this backlash because we started to hear designers did not want people of color wearing their clothes or they didn't want inner city kids or rappers, whatever the case is. And I'm sure those are rumors. Or I hope they were rumors of most of those companies. But then Timberland uh, had put in the New York Times something of the nature of we don't sell or make our boots for drug dealers. They're no longer owned by the same uh, company and they, they, they retracted a lot of the things that they said or, or attempted to. But it hurt me. Uh, dearly because I was spending so much money on Timberland boots because I loved them almost like the way the kids love Jordans and Yeezys that I went home and I created a brand, FUBU, For Us By Us. Um, and a lot of people thought it initially it was about a color, but it was about a culture. It wasn't going to be uh, a bigot the same way I felt at that time, the comment that came out of Timberland's mouth was. And I created my brand. Um, but, but what were the moments? I mean, I have so many moments. I mean, the one I remember is I sewed a bunch of hats by hand, and uh, uh, Good Friday, 1989, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I stood on the corner and I sold $800 worth of hats in one hour. <laughs> uh, and, no kidding. And was, yeah, and that was the moment I said, I will never work for anybody ever again for the rest of my life. And uh, reality set in, I went back to Red Lobster for another five years, but the feeling <laughs> was good at that moment. <laughs> <laughs> So, wow, I love that because so many people are looking these days for uh, a sign and not only maybe a sign, but a way to find their inner strength and do something with it. You know, it's so simple like to, to hear, to see you where you are now and think, well, this is always going to be the case. And 
perhaps that is the case because you will always going to work hard. You are always going to say, I'm not going to leave it up to somebody else. But what would you say for you for designing FUBU and to, to decide this is what I'm going to do and to find the strength to go out on on the street corner and sell it? Where does somebody find that? How, how can somebody manufacture that if that's what's necessary to find their way forward, Damon? I think that's a good question. I don't think that I've ever been asked that before. I think that it is starts off with you mentally knowing your why, but also putting the proper lens on, you know, what are you doing? What is the investment and what is the worst thing that can happen? Um, and I think that, uh, you know, the day of standing on the corner of selling FUBU, making the $800 worth of hats, I would close FUBU down three times from 89 to 92 because I ran out a little bit of a capital. But I would always look at my downside. And at the end of the day, I felt good about selling people something that they felt good about. But I'm going to tell you and be very honest why I, I, after that, for the next uh, three or four years, I would keep doing it. Number one, I felt important because people saw me wearing my own product. I wasn't Mm. making much money. Number two is when I went onto a video set and I only literally had the same 10 or 20 t-shirts for about two years, when they kicked everybody else off the video set... I was like, I'm here to dress the artist. I wasn't there to dress the artist. I was there to talk to the girls. I was there to get the free food. I was there to watch the artist. I mean, most people would pay to see their favorite artist perform. If I got to go to a video set and I got to see Run DMC or LL Cool J perform, Mama said, knock you out. Are you kidding me? This shirt is giving me the ability to go on there. So, But what I found is I kept finding more joy and more joy in what I was doing. And then I started to find ways to monetize that. And usually any entrepreneur or successful person in the world, they find a joy. They find tomorrow when they educate themselves on a better way, more way efficient way to do it and more ways to add value to their customer. You know, I mean, you've been there already. You could not be this. You could not be the Rich Eisner that we all respect and value if you weren't opening a Cracker Jack box every morning or every week when you found different ways or different people that walked up and you said, Rich, I love the position you did that. I never thought of that or whatever the case is. And, and that is the driving force on every single thing I do. I don't care about the downside. I only look up the upside. I don't risk too much. And I'm a little bit vulnerable. That's a great way to put it too, Damon, is vulnerable and not and not being fearful of of feeling it and and using it maybe as a, a springboard to never say no and always bet on yourself. I, I, I'll never forget when I was trying to get, you know, an on air job on, on TV and uh, I would just pack up my my tapes, my resume tapes in these big, thick, you know, three quarter inch boxes it was huge and i i i put a put on a suit and i i hopped in a car and i i road tripped upstate new york looking for just knocking on doors of news directors saying you know i I would make sure i wouldn't go during a news hour because that was definitely a way for me to say i don't know your business and i don't respect your business when i show up at your busiest time to ask for you know your time for for me to interview with you even though you're not looking to hire it really was just a so i I remember i i went and i went to upstate new york and i i i walked in uh to uh somebody's house that had yet to be yet to be it was still a startup because i sent a tape to a a a 24 7 news uh organization that was just formulating in the in in albany schenectady and troy new york you mentioned troy before um, you know, and, and they were they were just starting it up, you know, in the seat of New York State power to be a 24 seven news channel. And I sent a tape to them to be a sports guy. And they responded. They got my tape. And I just showed up on this person's step thinking it was a business. But instead, it was his house. And I I knocked on his door and he was in the bathroom when I showed up. I swear to God, this happened. And the person who answered the door said, hold on a second, I'll go get him. And I like all in the family, I heard a flush of the toilet upstairs. He comes downstairs and he says to me, to my face, I don't have time for this shit. I don't have any time for walk-ins and slammed the door in my face. And I thought I was so low. I felt so low. And I sat in the car and I had a, a moment sort of what you had at the Red Lobster. And I'm like, I am not gonna let this man 
define me. I will not let that happen. But I was vulnerable. I could not have been more vulnerable at that moment. And that was that was the lowest moment for me, man, when I was looking for work. Big time. So I hear you. And what did it do after that? It, it, there, You know, you have to have a strong rejection muscle in any form of success, um, especially when, you know, listen, and if everybody who's getting intimidated, around, uh, intimidated right now when I say that, every parent has a strong rejection muscle because when you deal with a two-year-old or five-year-old or ten-year-old, yeah, you have right. to have a strong rejection muscle. But what did that do to build character in you? Why did you get back up? I had no choice. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, wh- wh- I, I, I didn't think I had any choice. And I also firmly believed in myself. I really did. I really thought I am not going to let this guy who might have had a bad day or clearly the business wasn't off the ground. I mean, he was really, you know, he was he's he's dropping a deuce in his own house. You know what I mean? When I went and found him, to be honest with you. And I, I, I'm like, I am not going to I literally thought to myself, this is not going to work out. And then I said to myself, I'm not going to let this be the end of it because I'm going to I'm not going to give up because of this guy. And and sure enough, you know, interestingly enough, I got I wound up getting a job um, in Redding, California, um, had a great stint there and ESPN hired me from there. And in year two, year two of being on ESPN, they invited a whole bunch of media critics from around to show up on the Sports Center set and do a Sports Center you know, next to a real anchor, just to see how it put them in the shoes of the of the on air person. And uh, the person I was sitting next to was the 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 sports critic for the Albany Times Union. I'm like, I got a question for you. Did this, you know, did did, did do you have a 24 seven news television outlet? And he goes, No. I'm like, Did one ever start? Would you know if one was going to start? And he goes, Yeah. And he goes, Never started. And I sat there and I just nodded my head. I'm like, Damn straight, I didn't let that guy take me down he never got out of his house and i'm sitting where i wanted to be that i I really had that moment now we know why start now we know why it never started because he he did that to a lot of people and you never know who could have walked in that door and thank god he did it to you that's what i said that damon because i'm like what's more what's more um and you know i guess enterprising that i found you in your house you know like that's the type of guy you should say i want to hire that person but anyway, I, I bring that up because you, when you say vulnerable, that kind of hit a nerve in me, obviously, because to me, that is important because you still have to say vulnerable uh, is, is, is not a, a bad word. It is not. It is something that can be actually used as strength. It really can. I believe that. Putting yourself out. It's, it's another way of saying being willing to learn. It's, it's so many different ways than being vulnerable. And people respect it. The ones who respect it want to help and they want to work with you and uh not 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 that it's charity or pity you know what i mean so i that's what I, I think is key to being an entrepreneur key to success in life being open to learn being vulnerable and also having empathy for others what's up now this is sharp damon john here and if you're already here i already know you're dedicated to bettering yourself and learning as much as you can to learn even more, subscribe to my channel and make sure that you don't miss any of these valuable videos. And I will see you next time.